building synthetic derivatives on Ethereum. Um, just to quickly start off by introducing ourselves, uh, my name is Allison, I'm the co-founder of Uma. Um, I come from a traditional institutional finance background. Um, after graduating college, I traded uh, interest rate products at Goldman Sachs for about six years, managed a $30 billion book with $100 million. Ultimately decided though that, um, you know, that was just making rich people richer um, and wasn't particularly fun. Um, decided to get uh, back to my roots in technology, joined a uh, startup in California that did mobile lending. Um, still, that company is still doing great. But through that experience, I really discovered that you know, whether I was working with big central banks or micro-entrepreneurs in third world countries, the financial incentives that existed in our, the existing financial system just weren't aligned between different stakeholders. So I got very enchanted with all of this blockchain stuff, the idea that you could embed economic incentives into a technology and change the way that people interact with it. Um, and so that's how I came about to get started with UMA. Um, my co-presenter is my colleague, Regina. Hi, uh, I'm Regina. Uh, I lead our financial engineering efforts at UMA. Uh, I also came from a traditional, I'd say, finance background. So prior to uh, joining UMA, I was a equity derivative structure at a bank. So I thought a lot about um, different kinds of financial products and how to structure bespoke trades for clients. Great. So first, just to tell you a little bit about what we do at UMA, uh, we build financial infrastructure for Ethereum. And specifically, this means two things. Uh, one is a set of smart contract templates that you can use and fill in different parameters to create customized financial products. The other is a decentralized Oracle service that can be used to verify and validate the payoffs um, associated with these financial contracts. Um, today, this is the loose agenda. We're going to be talking about synthetic derivatives, different types of de derivatives, the market dynamics with which they trade, just a high level overview. Um, and then we're also going to be talking about what you can actually do with UMA uh, today. Uh, we've created uh, a, basically a, a subset, a particular type of synthetic derivative that you can actually use and interact with both on uh, the Ethereum Rinkeby testnet and mainnet. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about ways that uh, they are both being used and could be applied um, to different use cases today and how you could actually extend it further. Um, and then lastly, because all derivatives fundamentally require uh, an on-chain oracle, we're also going to touch on how you can actually write uh, secu secure, scalable financial contracts on the blockchain that don't require um, a constantly live on-chain price oracle called the Priceless Contract Design uh, Framework. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. Okay. So. Um, just to really quickly introduce synthetic derivatives here, I'm sorry if this is a little basic for some of you, um, but derivatives are a very, very, very flexible um, invention within financial products where basically you can create any arbitrary payout structure that you want um, based on external reference data. And so what we build at UMA is basically the smart contract templates of if this, then that logic for how different payouts should work. Um, and then the decentralized uh, Oracle service to validate the accuracy of this external reference. Um, and really simplistically, if you understand betting, you really probably get derivatives. Um, sorry, I'm American, so I used a football example here. Um, but you know, these uh, binary, discrete, and continuous examples here really are actually the simplest examples of derivatives that you could make. So you could create a binary derivative that's answering a yes-no question, like will the Giants win their next game? Um, if yes, pay Alice. If no, pay Bob. Um, that really is a binary derivative. Uh, same with discrete, where you're choosing between a discrete set of possible outcomes, um, like which team within the NFL is going to win the Super Bowl this year. Um, and then there's continuous derivatives, uh, like how many rushing yards are you going to have, or what's the valuation of a given team. Um, and just like when you're making a bet with somebody, you have to de define the terms of a derivative in advance. So uh, if you and I were to make a bet, right, in advance we'd say what size, like $10 that the Giants win their next game. Um, we would also define the expiration, or it might be implied that the <coughs> expiration is right after the next game occurs. Um, and we'd also have to talk about the collateralization and payout terms. Do I just trust you, or are we both going to put $10 into a pot and have somebody else hold on to it? And are we talking about dollars, or DAI, or ETH as the payout currency? 
And then finally, there's the valuation function. So a really simple binary bet is really easy to understand. $10 if the Giants win the next game for me, and $10 if the Giants lose their next game for you. Um, but the valuation functions are can become infinitely complex or composable as well. Um, so it could be like, you know, if the Giants ever win the next, or if the Giants win the next three of five, or if the Giants ever win um, some number of games in some particular permutation of ways over the next ten years of uh, existence. So the uh, thing that powers all of these synthetic derivatives. Um, is a external reference. So in the example of you and I making this bet about uh, whether the Giants are going to win uh, the next game or not, you know, we're kind of also implicitly, um, we're, 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 we need a way to actually reference and validate uh, you know, who actually won that next game. And unfortunately, when it comes to blockchain smart contracts, well, they're actually quite dumb when it comes to external data. They have no way of knowing anything about the external world. Um, and unfortunately, um, there's no external penalty um, if we encode all this logic into a smart contract, but somehow you're able to corrupt the oracle. Um, so what we need to do is, in order for us to even um, begin to think about building synthetic derivatives, we need a way of being able to build an honest oracle. Um, and so our, uh, the way that we've basically defined an honest oracle here is we're simply trying to create an oracle where the cost to corrupt this oracle is going to be greater than the profit. Our actual um, initial assertion is that any on-chain oracle can be corrupted. There's some way in which you could potentially, um, whether through a bribe or even hardware mal malfunction, cause an oracle to return bad data. So we need to make sure then that if we're going to be using an oracle to, uh, to validate the payouts of a multi-billion dollar or multi-trillion dollar contract, um, that we have a way to guarantee that it will be on and that it will be honest. And so in the example um, earlier of you know, Alice and Bob entering into a contract that has external reference data, the way that we can think about setting up these incentives is uh, any amount of money that Alice and Bob are putting into this contract uh, to back you know, their bet is a potential profit that somebody could earn if they were able to corrupt the data. Um, and the amount of money that an oracle would accept as a bribe to actually uh, corrupt that data is kind of the potential cost of corruption. So what we need to do is to design a mechanism to keep the cost of corruption greater than the potential profit from corruption. Um, and so it's really just three simple steps. Figure out what the cost of corrupting an oracle is, figure out the potential profit somebody could make by corrupting the oracle, and have this mechanism, uh, build this mechanism and prove that it's going to work. Um, ah, I cut the slides with all the math, but uh, the white paper is on our uh, GitHub if any of you are so inclined to go and, and look at it. Okay, What's so. The GitHub, sorry? I'm sorry? GitHub.com slash? Vuma protocol. Yep. Um, okay, so talking about synthetic derivatives, um, I gave the really high overview of how you can create arbitrary payouts, and these payouts can be binary or discrete or continuous. Um, there's also another thing to think about when it comes to synthetic derivatives and the, the way that they're created, which is how many counterparties are involved. So if it's just a bet between me and you, that's a bilateral trade, typically those are done peer-to-peer -peer or OTC. Um, and because it's just you and me that need to negotiate the terms of this thing, we can make it very, very customized. We can make the payout in Nike shoes if we wanted to, even though nobody else in their right mind would probably want to build out a market for trading, you know, Giants games relative to Nike shoes. Um, so uh, in other types of synthetic derivatives, the number of counterparties involved are way more numerous. So um, in some cases, you have many people who want to be on one side and many people who want to be on the other side. Um, typically, when that happens, uh, it, a good example of that would be like um, you know, BitMEX perpetual futures, where many people are long perpetual futures on BitMEX, many people are short perpetual futures on BitMEX. And what happens in the BitMEX exchange is every single term of the contract is already standardized, and the only thing that people are negotiating when they actually trade is price and size. So it simplifies the potential terms for negotiation because everything has, else has been standardized in advance, 
um, and it allows many people who are long and many people who are short to actually be able to coordinate to do a trade with each other. Um, generally speaking, many to many, uh, when the, the counterparties are many to many, um, those products trade on exchanges. And then there's this kind of newish paradigm that exists uh, in this blockchain space, which is a one to many uh, coordination mechanism. So that could be like one smart contract to many users of the smart contract. Or what Regina is going to be talking about later is actually our first template, uh, which is a template that lets you build synthetic tokens where there's one creator of the synthetic token facility and many users of the synthetic token that gets created from that facility. Um, and depending on the specific dynamics of that contract that they create, that product could subs subsequently trade peer-to-peer, -peer, OTC, or on exchange, depending on um, how, liquid, uh, how liquid the underlying product becomes. So as Allison mentioned, one of the first products or financial uh, product templates that we've created is one of these synthetic token builders. So I'll talk a little bit more about what a synthetic asset token is, and then I'll also show you hopefully a video of how you can actually use the synthetic token builder to build your own synthetic tokens on Rigby Testnet today. So a synthetic asset token is, as Allison said, a type of one-to-many derivative, a synthetic derivative. And what that means is that uh, one person, such as me, could create a token facility, which is this rectangle, could create this token facility, and then mint tokens from that token facility that I can then distribute to other people to give financial risk. So in that sense, it's one to many, where I'm a single token sponsor giving financial risk to many different people, all who just have to, have to hold some token. So they don't actually have to enter any particular bespoke agreement with me, all I have to do is buy a token that was created from the token facility that I created. Okay, so in that sense, a synthetic asset token looks a lot like other over-collateralized lending facilities that you might have seen. So I think this looks very similar to, for example, a maker CDP, where in the same framework, you're depositing some collateral and then using that collateral to back tokens that you're minting and then distributing to other people. There are definitely a couple of differences, though, between this and a maker CDP, namely uh, that these, for example, are expiring tokens. So what happens here is if I create this token facility, I use that to create some synthetic tokens that track the price of something. And what happens is that after a certain expiration timestamp, the amount of backing collateral that backs the tokens is fixed. So it's fixed to whatever the latest price was at that point and anyone can then redeem those tokens for the backing collateral. So that's one really big difference uh, between this and other you might have seen, like, perpetual lending facilities. But in some ways it is very similar, right? So you've also got these good and bad situations where depending on what the on-chain price feed tells you the price is, you can be under or over collateralized relative to the collateralization requirements. So in the good case, the price feed tells you, okay, this is the actual price, that's how much collateral you need to have to back the tokens. You need to be over collateralized by say five or 10%. That's where that is. And oh great, you've got excess collateral in excess of the required collateral. In the bad case, what happens is let's say, again, the reference price comes in at this. It says you need to have this much required collateral, but you're under collateralized relative to that. That's fine. A penalty is assessed. That's awarded to the token holders. Anyone who holds those tokens is able to come in and redeem their tokens for the backing collateral plus a proportional amount of the penalty, and the whole trade is unwound. So there are two, I'd say, main differences here. One is that the tokens always have an expiry. So they have this uh, feature where they can be redeemed for the backing collateral when they expire. And the second is that these token facilities are not fungible. If I create a token facility, and I emit these tokens, those tokens can't be redeemed against someone else's facility. So they're non-fungible in that sense. Whereas with DAI, right, DAI is fungible, you can use DAI to close out anyone's CDP. So those are two of the main differences behind the synthetic asset tokens. And I'm more than happy to discuss some of the motivations behind why we chose uh, to include those two features um, that has its whole own set of design principles. But that's roughly how a synthetic asset token works. 
And we think this is really exciting because it means that you can use this financial contract template to create lots of different kinds of financial risk and provide that type of financial risk to lots of different people, thus enabling universal market access. So Allison will discuss some other examples of that, but first I'm going to show you uh, that you can build your own tokens on Rigby using the synthetic token builder. So if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you can go to tokenbuilder.umoproject.org. And on Rinkby Testnet, you'll be able to actually follow along with, hopefully, the video that I'm about to show you. You just need to have Testnet ETH and Testnet DAI. All right, so let me try to get this video up. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so if you're able to get to this website and you have Testnet ETH and Testnet DAI, uh, first thing you're going to do is open a token facility. So that's actually creating that box that I showed you in the diagram before, right? So what does that mean? You're setting a bunch of parameters and then launching a smart contract. So when you launch the smart contract, it's like you're opening a new token facility. Then you're going to deposit some money into that token facility, right? And borrow tokens that are backed by some portion of that margin. So in this case, they're depositing 10,000 testnet DAI and withdrawing five tokens. So they're borrowing five tokens that are backed by the 10,000 dies that they deposited. So I think this, this clip is actually 50 seconds, so really fast. Um, and if you know what you're doing, of course, it's, it's super fast. But you should feel free to actually go in, look at the different price feeds that we've already curated for you, as well as some of the expertise that we've curated. Um, play around with it, create your own tokens, send them to people, uh, have test net financial risk. Uh, and, and check it out. But that's how we've basically shown you the financial engineering behind it, right? And then we've shown you an implementation or a way that people can access that type of financial engineering. Is I think, especially as a structure, I see the first kind of diagram with boxes and arrows and cash flows, and it makes a lot of sense to me. But one of the really cool things about tokenizing this kind of financial risk is that it becomes very accessible. Once you have these tokens on testnet, you can just send them to anyone and begin your financial risk that way. There's no need to hammer out a bilateral agreement uh, between two counterparties. So that's the video. Let me close this. Um, was anyone able to actually get onto the token builder? <laughs> well, we tried, and uh, for at least trying, uh, this is the, <laughs> the QR code for that uh, Ethereum Galaxy game. Um, so that was going to be our, our little challenge, but um, feel free to scan that and then collect your, your star. I'm just going to pass it around too so that Regina can move on with the presentation if you don't have it yet. Okay. I see some phones, so I will give you three seconds. Okay, and that's it, that's it. So we're, we're moving forward. But anyway, <laughs> the paper is circulating. <laughs> but I did three seconds. So okay, now we're gonna talk about a bit more about the financial engineering behind the scenes and what that synthetic asset token really is and what it's doing. So as I mentioned before, right? In that video, what someone did was, the first thing he did was he defined a couple of parameters. So he chose a price fee, he chose an expiration date, he chose a name for his tokens and his token facility. Then he deployed the contract, right? So now we've actually got a token facility that's live on Rinkby Testnet. Then what did he do? He deposited the collateral, right? So he deposited DAI. DAI is the margin currency that we've chosen for the synthetic token builder at this point. Um, but of course, that's something that you could change. Uh, we, so you deposit DAI into the token facility. Then you borrow tokens that are backed by some portion of that DAI. Remember that you're over collateralizing the value of the tokens that you're borrowing. And so there will be at least as much DAI in there as the value, the DAI value of the tokens that you're borrowing. And then once you do that, right, that's all done by this token sponsor. So that was the position that I was saying I had before. I'm a token sponsor, so I'm creating the token facility and then borrowing the tokens. And now, as a token sponsor, now that I have these tokens, what I do with them, I trade them with someone. I trade them with a token holder um, to actually begin having financial risk. 
just raise your hand if you understand why the token sponsor doesn't have any financial risk here before this. Okay. Okay, so I think that's actually, that's a really interesting um, data point. Happy to go into that in more detail later, um, but that's also an interesting tidbit about this kind of uh, token, facility, token facility deployment, is that before here, before you trade them with, with anyone, you actually have no risk to the price speed that you're using. But in any case, uh, sure. Yeah, good question on defining the parameters. Looks like you have, uh a limited set of oracles and some expiration dates. So how do you think about letting people create contracts and do composability versus just launching the token yourself, like launching like the UMA Gold token? Yeah, perfect question. Allison is going to discuss a lot of that um, in, the, in the next couple of sections. So um, yeah, so I just wanted to highlight here that the idea is someone is defining a bunch of parameters and then launching a token facility from which they borrow these tokens and then sell them. But to your point, absolutely, you can change the parameters, and we would love to see people change the parameters that are currently available and include their, their own parameters. So what you can do is, again, if anyone can access this, um, this is just a link to the GitHub where all of the code that powers the synthetic token builder lives. So you could actually go there and follow along as I'm talking about this. But there's, uh, in the code, there's a section where we define a bunch of the parameters in the for a token facility. And I want to highlight three of these parameters because I think they'll probably be the most interesting to people who want to create their own token facilities or synthetic tokens. One is this finder address. So this is basically the price feed, right? The on-chain price feed that the token price is going to track. So if I say, for example, that this address points to an on-chain price feed for the price of Bitcoin and DAI, it means that each of my synthetic asset tokens that I'm borrowing from the token facility will be backed by that number of DAI. So that's one that should be interesting. Uh, and the two other ones are the expiration date of the facility. So in the synthetic token builder in the video, you might have seen that there are a couple of pre-selected dates, but you can choose other ones. Um, and then the margin currency of the facility. So as I mentioned, right now we're using DAI on testnet but you could certainly change that to be a different margin currency that you would like. We already have some cool projects that have done things like that or are looking to do things like that. So Allison's gonna spend a bit more time talking about those projects that she's seen, as well as some ideas for those of you out there who wanna build new things. Okay, so we started off by saying UMA is a decentralized financial contracts uh, platform with a decentralized Oracle service and smart contract templates. Uh, specifically, right now, the first one uh, that we've created is the synthetic token template. And uh, what you can do to customize and adapt the synthetic token template to your particular use case or need um, is first, choose the reference price index. Um, and as Regina mentioned, in the UI, we had already curated a certain set of price indices that we thought the audience might find interesting. Um, but the cool thing about derivatives is that your imagination now is really the limit. Um, so in terms of the prices that you want to reference, you can reference cross-chain assets like Bitcoin or EOS or whatever, off-chain assets like traditional fiat assets, gold, um, S&P 500, et cetera, local currencies, um, so not just dollars, but sterling or um, any local uh, foreign exchange currency that you can think of, and then also non-tradable things. So things that aren't inherently assets or things that you can touch and buy, um, but rather just price indices. So for example, the number of followers that CZ has on Twitter, or uh, the number of upvotes that a particular Reddit post has, or my favorite topic, interest rates, which we're going to get into later. Um, you can also customize your margin currency. So, you know, in the DAP UI, we uh, curated it with DAI. It's just a little bit easier from a mental model perspective, I think, to think about things in dollars. But you could also use ETH or even things like interest-bearing stable coins so that you can be even more efficient with your margin. Um, and then once you've created your synthetic token, there's a lot of different ways to actually apply them and use them. So you could go and trade them on an exchange or build, a, build an exchange around synthetic tokens. Uh, you could use them for local payments. Um, you could, in, like for example, if we had a synthetic yen token, we could be trading yen with each other um, instead of trying to figure out actual cash. 
Uh, you could obviously interface with them through a wallet or some other sort of brokerage experience. Um, and by a brokerage experience, just to differentiate that from exchange, that's like how um, if you're buying stocks in the US or something, you're probably buying them through a broker. You're buying them through like Fidelity or Robinhood or E-Trade, um, as opposed to trading directly on the New York Stock Exchange or something like that. Um, and then you can also look at um, creating funding and issuance platforms. So much like the Maker CDP portal, um, you could actually use these token facilities to attain leverage for yourself, but in this case, customize levered exposures. Um, so just to highlight some of the use cases that we found really interesting um, and that we're either uh, working with on proof of concepts um, or, or supporting in the marketplace, um, I talked a little bit earlier about local currencies and how they can be used for payments. Uh, there's a really interesting company called Sempo. Um, <laughs> hi! <laughs> so they're building, um, they uh, basically help NGOs to give aid um, directly in places that have been affected by disaster. Um, and for an aid recipient, right, they don't really want to think about DAI or ETH or whatever. They think about their world in their local currency. But unless their local currency exists as a stable coin on the blockchain, we can't actually use a blockchain-based wallet to facilitate that whole process. Um, so what we can actually do then with the synthetic token builder is reference the price of the local currency, so like the VATU DAI exchange rate, um, and then we can margin that contract with something that has real value like DAI or CDAI, interest-bearing DAI, and then we can use the synthetic VATU tokens that get created um, in the actual wallet and payment system so that from a user experience perspective, the end user just thinks, oh, I'm moving VATU around. Great, like I'm familiar with that instead of having to do some sort of mental gymnastics around what the DAI to VATU exchange rate is. Um, another really cool use case, I don't know if Tom's here, but um, <laughs> If you're building international wallets or serving international users, many of them lack access to um, international uh, traditional fiat assets. Or if they're already crypto native, just would prefer the convenience of being able to manage all of their financial assets out of a single wallet. Um, so what we can do is reference something, uh, something like the S&P 500 or another major global stock exchange margin it again either in a stable coin or an interest bearing stable coin depending on how capital efficient you want to be create these synthetic tokens that track the value of let's say the S&P 500 and then actually sell that to these international users that are looking to invest um, in US stock uh, indices but don't otherwise have access to it and then the third use case is making otherwise untradeable things actually become tradable so a lot of people talk about Bitcoin dominance, right? Um, and you can look at you know, the Bitcoin dominance index, um, or you could look at an altcoin dominance index, whatever it is. It's actually really, really hard to trade, right? There's thousands of coins. Imagine trying to actually go around and swapping those in and out and then rebalancing it in live time. Um, you'd incur a great deal of, uh, of trading costs, and it's just kind of a, a headache. Well, what you could do instead is you could create a synthetic token that directly references the Bitcoin dominance index itself, uh, margin it in whatever you think makes sense, um, and then take these subsequent tokens and trade them out. So if you wanted to, if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, right, um, you could actually buy a Bitcoin dominance token. Or if you're an altcoin, if you wanted to short like the 2017 ICO craze, you could try to <laughs> create this facility and sell an altcoin dominance uh, token to somebody else as well. Um, on the topic of non-tradable indices, um, I'm going to talk about interest rates in particular. Um, so interest rates have this really, really interesting quality where um, they give you one more variable to play with. So most of the time if you're trading something, like if you're trading Bitcoin for ETH, there's only two variables that you care about. How much am I trading and what's the price that I'm trading at? Um, and you know, most things kind of follow your standard uh, 2D supply and demand curve. When you're trading interest rates, you add another variable of time. So interest rates measure the cost of renting some amount of money for a period of time. Um, and you end up being able to basically create these 3D interest rate curves according to um, what the cost of renting that money is, how much money you're trying to rent, and how long you're trying to rent it for. Um, the killer use case so far in 
basically all of DeFi has been within borrowing and lending. Um, and that the interest rates that are used in those borrowing and lending uh, protocols have all just been short-term interest rates. They're more or less ignoring time, and they're saying, here's the cost to rent die for, uh, you know, to rent, you know, 100 die. Um, and then the interest rate actually resets every time uh, the stability fee changes or every time somebody new interacts with that compound lending pool. But, oh, but uh, if we wanted to create an interest rate market, we could actually create a market for uh, how much it would cost to rent that specific amount of DAI for a defined and longer uh, period of time. The reason why this is important is because, first of all, it's a huge, huge, huge market. Um, if we look at the fiat world, derivatives are a 500 plus trillion dollar market. Almost all of it is interest rates. Um, so, and if you want to talk about uniquely enabled use cases, these things have to be traded synthetically. There is no other way to trade time without a synthetic derivative because an interest rate is an abstract thing. You can't touch, look, see, or feel it. It's not a token. You can only trade it in the form of a derivative. Um, and it's important, actually, that we are able to trade these interest rates and allow people to trade interest rate risk um, over time because right now the only reason why people are using these borrowing and lending pools in DeFi is generally for speculative and kind of not price sensitive use cases. Right? If I believe that ETH is going to moon next week, I don't really care if I'm borrowing at 1%, 10%, or 25%. But if you're talking about non-speculative use cases, a uh, home loan, a car loan, business loan, student loan, uh, price does matter a lot more. And the ability for borrowers and lenders to actually start offsetting their interest rate risk, the ability to lock in interest rates or speculate on interest rates is a fundamental necessity in order for these use cases to get unlocked in DeFi. So this is why uh, you know, we care a lot about this. There's a whole hour and a half long workshop on YouTube that you guys can find later if you want to go really deeper in. Um, but I'm going to highlight three ways actually that you can create interest rate products with UMA today using the synthetic token template. Now I'm not saying that the synthetic token template is necessarily the way that um, it should be created or the way that it, it um, necessarily will exist forever and ever and ever, but these are actually three different ways that you can actually create them today um, that would give us price discovery um, and insight into how this market could evolve. Um, and so these three are y to kind of a simplified version of Dan Robinson's Y tokens. SUMA, which is a project that came out of ETH Boston, um, and then fixed rate tokens, which is more or less something that I made up. Um, <laughs> so to dive into these, um, so how many of you have read the Y token paper? Just Okay, okay, cool. So the way that basically Y tokens work is you're trying to create a uh, yield curve for what the ETH dollar funding rate looks like over time. Um, so how much money will it cost, or sorry, how much will it cost for me to borrow dollars against my ETH for different periods of time? That's, that's what a yield curve for ETH dollar would be, um, and, and that's what the motivation is for creating Y tokens is. The way that it would work is you take the UMA synthetic token template, you make the reference price index the price of dollar ETH, so it's just one divided by the price of ETH. Um, you use ETH as the margin currency, and you basically just say that every token I borrow will pay out $1 at expiration. If the price of ETH goes up, it's less ETH. And if the price of ETH goes down, it's more ETH. It's always $1 worth of ETH at expiration. Um, and so effectively, it's sort of like what you've created there is an expiring stable coin. From the token sponsor's perspective, if they were to create this product, create this token facility and borrow tokens against it, it would enable them to get levered ETH exposure. Kind of a similar reason to why anybody might open up a, a MakerDAO CDP or something like that. Um, but the difference is that the way that they would get this exposure uh, would be uh, with a fixed interest rate over the lifetime um, of that token facility. From a token holder's perspective, they get to own a token that they can redeem for $1 at expiration. Um, and they're buying it for less than $1 initially. Free money, right? But basically it's it's kind of like um, interest 
it's an interest-bearing token, interest-bearing stable coin, but you know, kind of different from CDI. Um, and if we have a market for this, what we could do is observe the market price for these Y tokens that have different expiration dates and use that market price to calculate back into what the implied funding rate for ETH dollar is for different periods of time. So you could create a, a Y token that expires in three months, a Y token that expires in six months, and a Y token that expires in one year. They would all have different prices. And based on that price, you could get an implied interest rate um, based on that implied interest rate, you'd be able to build out a yield curve, and then you'd have better visibility into what the market expects the ETH dollar funding rate to look like over periods of time. Right now, all we know is that the maker what the maker stability fee is today. We don't know what it'll be next week, we don't know what it'll be next month, and it's actually quite hard to figure out what expectations are. If any of you have ever been on any of those governance calls, there's quite a bit of debate. This would actually give them more insight into what the market uh, already naturally expects uh, the interest rate to be um, over different periods of time. Um, another way to create this is through uh, SUMA tokens where basically the reference price index is 100 minus the expected st uh, stability fee that you would pay between two fixed uh, dates. So let's say we're, the two fixed dates are January 1st to December 31st. Um, and we're, uh, what we're referencing is what the market expects the stability fee to be on average between Jan 1 and DS 31, and then we take 100 minus that. Um, so the price of this thing would generally always be less than 100. Um, the reason, uh, and the reason why somebody might actually want to do this is if they wanted to really directly speculate on what their expectation of what the expectation of uh, interest rates are over time. So the token sponsor would make money if rates increase. Effectively, a token sponsor could use this if they were a borrower and they were worried that interest rates were going to increase. Um, and so they could create these SUMA tokens um, in order to match off the P&L there. Um, from a SUMA holder's perspective, they make money if rates decline. Um, it's kind of like a lender who wants to lock in their interest rate today because they think interest rates are really high and they're going to go down in the future. And the same deal, we can look at the market implied price um, and it'll reveal information about what the market expects uh, the interest rate to finally be in the future. Final version is a fixed rate token. It's just kind of like SUMA tokens, but a little bit simplified. You just directly reference an expectation of what an interest rate will be between two fixed dates, and you tokenize it. So if I say, like, you know, between Jan 1 and D31, the expected interest rate is 10%. Every token, uh, so the interest on a 100 die loan would be 10 die. Um, then the token would be redeemed for 10 die at expiration. And then you can directly trade these fixed rate tokens between each other. So every token is effectively the variable interest rate that you expect uh, the MakerDAO system to cost you on a $100 loan um, over those two fixed dates. So <laughs> to kind of summarize what we covered there with all these different use cases, um, synthetic products are highly composable within the DeFi and general Ethereum universe. And the innovation can kind of occur at many different levels. The innovation can occur, occur at the uh, price index level where you can just make up basically or reference arbitrary price indices. The financial engineering level, basically the interaction between the <coughs> price index and the margin currency and the payout structure that you're creating or even at the application layer. So how you're delivering the product to the user and what's new or unique or, or different or special about the way that you're delivering that product. Um, and synthetics are really great because they you know, offer the features of leverage, support for cross-chain, off-chain, non-tradable assets, um, and this ability for synthetics to enable risk transfer for things that were previously uh, not tradable is critical for developing markets like interest rate markets um, where we can start to think about supporting non-speculative use cases. And so Regina um, is now going to talk about how you can actually build um, 
contract templates, not necessarily just the synthetic token one that we already have, but other contract templates that are safe, secure, and, uh, and scalable. The fundament as great as um, synthetics are, um, at a fundamental level, they all require an oracle. And on-chain price feeds are expensive. They um, are hard to maintain. They're dangerous. Um, you know, a number of DeFi projects out there all do use oracles, and many of them have had oracles that have actually failed at some point or the other. Um, and so we actually believe that you know it's it's going to be really hard for DeFi to actually scale at a global and large size um, without a secure on-chain, or sorry, without a secure oracle. But we believe that the right way to actually build these contracts that need an external price reference is actually to minimize the use of on-chain um, oracles at all. And so Regina is going to talk about our, our uh, framework for writing templates that fulfill this. I want to emphasize one more time that the topic of this workshop is building synthetic derivatives. Right? So what we mean by synthetic is specifically this, that the financial risk that you have on-chain comes from an external price feed comes from a reference asset that the derivative is referring to rather than any sort of physical token that's being borrowed or lent to achieve leverage. I just want to emphasize that like very, very clearly because I think the rest of this talk is going to be about getting rid of those price feeds. And so I want to make sure that we're under a chance that like synthetic derivatives are all about referencing an asset and they have nothing to do with um, like actually physically borrowing or lending anything to get leverage. So on that note, we talked about this token facility, right? And how uh, there is a certain price uh, that comes in from this price feed that tells you how much collateral you need to have to actually fully back the tokens. And then again, what your collateralization requirement is. So based off of this one price feed that's being pushed into this uh, token facility, we know both the price, so the amount of backing collateral, and the amount of required collateral. So we know these two things, then we just do a check to see if you have sufficient collateral to meet those requirements, right? And so depending on what price the price feed pushes, you know that you're either in this state or in this state. And once you're in this state, you know that, okay, great, like this penalty is assessed, and that all gets paid out to the token holders, and people get to redeem. So this is how probably most people think of synthetic derivatives. I'd say, in fact, this has a lot of analogies to how fiat works and how uh, synthetic derivatives are settled in fiat. So if this is our existing framework for how we margin and trade and settle synthetic derivatives, we've got a lot of dependency on this price feed. And that's why these price feeds are so expensive. We pay a lot for them uh, in the fiat world. Uh, and of course, as Allison has been talking about with the Oracle, they're corruptible. So if I stand to make a lot of money by, say, maybe from this penalty, maybe it's really in my favor to, to corrupt this price feed so I can recoup the penalty, or so that I can really reduce the amount of money that token holders get, I might want to corrupt this price feed. There are a lot of reasons that, in DeFi especially, this is susceptible, and in fiat, there are a lot of reasons why this is really expensive. So I'd say it's funny, because like in fiat, it's expensive from a dollar cost perspective, and in DeFi, it's also expensive from a, like, computation and keeping things um, alive on chain perspective. We are talking a lot about corruptible oracles. Uh, is there any legal framework to basically put some liability um, for uh, for the price hits, like in the current business? In fiat? In traditional business? Yeah, so I, in traditional finance, I think, uh, there, there might be. I would say the large, like the, the more conventional way that we've addressed this issue in fiat is uh, we hire a lot of people to look at prices and confirm that the prices that are being sent from one custodian to the other custodian are correct. But if somebody will lie, then you know, we can undo the things, right? And yeah, that's another thing that you can do on fiat is that you can undo these transactions. So you can hire people to go back and, and move money back from certain accounts to other accounts. But we should be able to backport this feature. I know it's not fully trustless or let's say like mm -hmm. automated, but no, this is the world we are living in, like, the, you know, the, the light can happen. Yeah, I think that's a little bit out of scope for this presentation, but happy to discuss uh, later. Okay, so as I mentioned before, right, in that picture, we've got these price feeds that are regularly pushing prices to smart contracts. So one way to visualize this is to say, okay, we've got this price feed that runs that someone has to maintain, 
Um, it's an unverified price feed uh, here in the sense that I'm going to say it's just something that's been piped in from, say, Bloomberg onto the blockchain. Maybe we're using um, uh, some service that ensures that you know it's not been corrupted from Bloomberg uh, on its way to the blockchain, but it's unverified in the sense that like if it comes out incorrect from Bloomberg, we don't really have a, a solution. So here we've got some price feed that's regularly pushing prices to this smart contract at say frequent 15 minute price updates, right? So the question is, how do you provide prices so quickly from a decentralized economically guaranteed oracle? So that's the big question that we're trying to answer, right? We want these prices to come frequently so that we can liquidate people when they need to be liquidated, but we also need enough time to actually have, I guess in the fiat world, to have like humans look at prices and check to make sure that they're correct. So how do we, how do we address this problem? I think there are two options that we're currently seeing um, in DeFi. The first is you can implement a delay at the Oracle level. So what you can do is you can say, we're still going to get prices every 15 minutes, but each of those prices is going to be delayed by an hour. So the price you get at 1 p.m. is actually the price from 12 p.m. So 1 p.m. in blockchain time or like real world time corresponds to a price of 12 p.m. So you're basically giving people a one hour delay before the price from 12 o'clock hits the blockchain at 1 o'clock. One thing that's really cool is uh, this looks kind of like how a settlement works in fiat. So right now, if you trade stocks, uh, let's say in your uh, brokerage account, as Allison mentioned, uh, you get filled at a certain price and you know that you got executed at, say, the price from 12 o'clock, but the stock doesn't actually arrive at your custodian until, say, two business days later. So you don't physically have it or you don't have that record implemented until that time. So in that way, right, it's a lot like uh, this kind of mechanism, where you've got this price that's delayed, then hitting the blockchain at a later time, and then you move, you actually move tokens or collateral at 1 p.m. to correspond to the 12 p.m. price. So that's one option. Um, one of the challenges with this, though, is it puts everyone on the same clock. Right? So this isn't great because let's say you've got a lot of different smart contracts that all depend on the same price. Speed. Um, it, this is fine, but it means that let's say you've got some contracts that have you know a small amount of money, and you're okay having it be updated every 15 minutes. You don't need the one hour delay. It's not that much money at risk. Like I'd be happy without it. But let's say you also have some contracts that have a lot of money, and you really, really care about making sure those prices are right. Well, this, this it works, but it puts everyone on the same clock. So maybe not ideal. Another option is you can implement the delay at the smart contract level. So what you can say is, uh, right, so again, the price is coming in exactly at one o'clock this time. But then what we say, that's fine. Uh, we recognize that price on chain, but we're gonna move margin uh, at two o'clock. So here it's just like the, the picture I had before, but instead of implementing the delay at the Oracle level, we're implementing it at the smart contract level. But still, it, again, it looks still like some of the fiat. It still looks like the option from before. The only difference is, do we implement the delay when we're moving margin, or do we implement the delay when the price is coming on chain? It requires fewer Oracle calls in the sense that you don't have, for example, here, right? Like you don't have uh, this like one hour delay, so it's a little bit less Oracle intensive. But you still have the problem of you just put a one hour delay somewhere, whether it's at this level or at this level. Say again, what's the benefit of the delay? So the benefit of the delay is uh, if you have, for example, a price that you're seeing in the real world at uh, 12 o'clock, it gives time for us all to agree that that price for 12 o'clock was the correct price. And when I say us all to agree, I mean physically for like, Human, human analysts to look at it and like confirm, oh, that makes sense. The price of the S&P is not 200, right? Um, and so it, it gives people a chance to review that. So as you can see, both of these options are doable. Certainly they have been implemented, but they're not great. Like you still have this whole settlement issue. You still have unverified price feeds. So what I'm gonna propose is instead of pushing prices to smart contracts, 
let's let the projects just pull them when they need them, right? So instead of having all of these prices pushed onto the smart contract, why not have a smart contract that says, okay, like I don't need to know the price right now because everything's going fine, uh, there are no liquidations, I don't think there should be any liquidations, it's fine, right? So, so we're here, like everything's going fine. Then, when you see in this DeFi smart contract that there's something that would require a price, say, oh hey, like I think there should be a liquidation here, why not let them just raise that as an issue, I'm gonna call that a dispute in this picture, but raise that as an issue, and then let an oracle handle it then. <coughs> so this concept, I think, is one of the most important things in designing like financial contracts that are compatible with an oracle is this movement away from a push mentality into a pull mentality. So as you can see here, right, like I'm moving away from having someone push prices into a smart contract and just letting the smart contract pull prices from, in this case, a decentralized economically guaranteed oracle and just pull those prices when it needs them. Great. Great question. So the smart contract doesn't know what the price is, right? Because the smart contract hasn't actually pulled for a price. It doesn't know. It doesn't know if you should be liquidated. But we've got a bunch of human beings interacting, or I guess like other robots, in interacting with these smart contracts. And they can do the work of saying, oh, based on my assumption of what the price is right now, I don't think there should be a liquidation. So I don't need to raise a dispute to make that smart contract pull a price down. What I can do is I can say, well, it looks fine to me because I can see off-chain that, oh, like I look at the price on Bloomberg, it looks fine, I think that these should not be liquidated. I'm okay, I don't need to pull a price. So I'm basically saying that the human beings or the other robots interacting with the smart contract are looking at that smart contract and saying, I don't need to go pull a price right now. I'm letting them decide when okay, there's actually a situation where someone's actually in default, someone needs to be disputed, someone needs to be liquidated. At that time, there needs to be an issue that's raised to another power that can say, okay, you're correct, you're right in saying liquidated, I'm now going to give you the final verdict on what that price is. Are you worried about DOS attacks? Great question. Um, I actually think it's a really great technical oh, question that, Oh, sorry, uh, are we worried about DOS attacks? Oh, okay. Great question. Our team has done some thinking on that. Um, I will put you in touch with, with those people after this. Cool. So, so let's, I want, I want to get through the rest of the, these slides because I do want to mention this in the context of synthetic tokens, which I hope will be helpful in understanding the framework. More than happy to take questions after this and, and outside. Cool. So I talked about this framework, right? Now let's talk about how you might apply them to the synthetic tokens that we were just talking about. Because in the synthetic tokens before, right, there still was that problem of, okay, well, we've got these on-chain price feeds that our team is really hard to put on-chain, but those are still corruptible and potentially um, could cause liquidations when there shouldn't be. So how do we make these synthetic tokens in the priceless framework? I, I kind of mentioned this in my answer to that answer question so I, why I took it, but, um, Here's, here's what you could do, right? You've got a token facility. You know there's backing collateral in it. And you know that there's some amount of total collateral. So I can see this information. I can see this information, kind of. But what I really can see is the total collateral. And then, I'm sorry, I'm saying I as the token holder, right? So I'm someone who holds a token that was issued from here. What I can say is I see the total collateral. When I look outside of testnet, I look and I say, oh, okay, Bloomberg is telling me this price. Based on that information, I can say, well, that looks right. Okay, he's got enough collateral that if that price were to be pulled onto the blockchain right now, and it really were that price, there would be no issue. Uh, this person would have enough backing collateral, they would have enough to meet the required collateral. These question marks would turn into checks. And so, what I can do as a token holder is say, this looks fine, 
I don't need you to pull in a uh, price. I don't need you to, to pull that data and perform that very expensive uh, check to make sure that everyone agrees on the price. This looks fine. I'm happy with it. The token sponsor is free right now to keep depositing or withdrawing margin from their token facility. They're free to keep doing this because no one's disputed his position. But if something were to happen, let's say I look off chain on the token holder, I look off chain and the price actually looks really, really high. And I think to myself, hmm, the total collateral actually is lower than the required collateral. There should be more collateral in here, right? That's an issue. So why is this red, right? That's an issue. So what should I do? I should say, that looks wrong. DBM, help us resolve this dispute. Raise this issue to, as I was saying before, the other power, this DBM. Raise this issue to them and say, hey, we need you to pull a price on chain now. We need you to come and resolve this dispute because I think this guy is under collateralized. You need to help us resolve that issue. And that's why UMA is building a DVM to help answer that question, right? To say, hi, how can I help in this situation, right? So we've got these two scenarios, right? In the happy path, in the happy scenario, this is going on. No one needs to pull an expensive price on chain. Uh, token sponsors are free to deposit and withdraw with no delay. Well, with some delay, I'll go into the delay uh, in a bit, but they're free to deposit and withdraw. In the unhappy path, in the unhappy case, well, we've frozen the margin in here while this DVM, the DVM stands for uh, data verification mechanism, but um, while this dispute resolution process takes place, we freeze the margin and someone else does that work of pulling that price of the chain. So what does that mean for a smart contract? If you're building a smart contract that intends to use this framework, what additional considerations do you need to have? The way it works is your smart contract, right? Remember, this is the token facility from before that was deployed in the Rink B testnet. This token facility needs to consistently pay these continuous taxes. So what we have in this picture is they're paying taxes regularly to this UMA store contract. So you've got a token facility that's paying these taxes and that helps ensure that, going back to Allison's statement about the Oracle, it helps ensure that the cost of corruption is higher than the profit from corruption. Because what this is doing is it's saying these taxes are going to make the cost of corruption higher. And once you've done that, right, once you've created a token facility that's up to date on its taxes, that's paid the correct amount of taxes, it gives them the ability to later call the DVM when they need it. So what you can do is you can say, well, as, as, the, as UMA's DVM, as the Oracle, I say, well, great, this token facility has paid its taxes regularly. Now that they need to raise a dispute, I'm more than happy to assist. When they do that, right, the token facility requests the price on chain, we pull it in to resolve the dispute. It generates an answer. And then you, as the smart contract, can go in and retrieve the price from that oracle. Great. So to recap what we've discussed so far, actually, I guess this is all of it, but to recap what we've, what we've discussed, we started out this conversation talking about on-chain price feeds and financial contract templates, right? We started out talking about how um, with these and with our synthetic token builder uh, contract, with the synthetic asset token contract, uh, all the different kinds of things you can do with that. And Allison gave like six or nine examples of things that you can build with that and more. Um, and we would love, love, love to hear other things that you want to do with these things and how you might use them in different applications. So if you have ideas about that, please, please talk to Allison. Um, because we're thinking a lot about you know, how you can use these templates to, to make cool uh, tools for other projects. Then from there, we talked about how you could deploy these financial contracts with new parameters. So we talked about how if you change, for example, the price feed, or you change uh, the expiration date or the margin currency, you can make new things that put, go into those applications. Matt Rice, who's our lead engineer, he's sitting here uh, and can help with anyone who has questions about how to do that from a technical perspective. 
And then we ended this conversation with how you can use, you can kind of skip these on-chain price feeds and build things that rely on oracles or these kinds of backup oracles like UMA's DVM and how you can design different types of financial products in that way. And so if you want to talk about that more, uh, please find me. So that's kind of what we've discussed uh, so far. Um, more than happy to take questions now uh, and have additional conversations. Cool. Uh, is there a mic we should use or should they just yell? Just yell. Just yell? Okay. Uh, uh, can you explain in more details uh, how uh, taxes uh, from the contract to UMA uh, will help uh, to uh, keep uh, the Oracle uh, on? Sure, sure. So uh, the basic idea of how the Oracle works is that uh, when the oracle is requested, the price is requested from the oracle. Okay, when, when a price is requested from the oracle, the oracle then goes out to a bunch of people, or I'm, I'm, I'm saying this very colloquially, but it goes out to a bunch of people and says, uh, tell us what you think the correct price should be. Those people then submit their answers for, oh, I think the price should be this. And they also have some balance of voting tokens. So those voting tokens influence uh, or determine how much influence they have over the correct, uh, the final price that's returned to the smart contract. So the, it's basically if you own more voting tokens, you have more of a say in what the right price is. The taxes that I was describing before, those go to do uh, token buybacks. So those increase the cost of corruption because now those tokens have gone to, to increase the price of the tokens. So if you want to go and bribe the oracle, you need to go out and buy more voting tokens, but those voting tokens are now expensive. That's the cost of corruption. So the only way uh, to get uh, that uh, voting tokens is from uh, taxes which were paid. Or, or I can get it uh, somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, if I want to vote on prices for the Oracle, I can go out and buy the voting token, but the price at which I have to buy the voting token is influenced, of course, by the, the buybacks. Okay. Do those voting tokens get burned when they get used, or do you get them back after the vote? Because otherwise it wouldn't really be a cost, right? Because you buy the asset, you vote, but then you get the asset back. I'll, I'll let Matt, Matt take that one. It'll get burned. They get, uh, the idea is that if the price is ever wrong, the value of those vote tokens goes to zero because you effectively corrupt the system so they're worthless because you don't expect people to use the system in the future. So, so the vote tokens, you don't burn them. The idea is that you're holding them. So if you were to do something bad, the value you're holding will go to zero. So that's, that's the economic uh, incentive. I'm having a lot of trouble understanding the value of what you propose because I think what you're doing is you're replacing the uh, human driven system that we currently have and the defects that we have with another hybrid human driven system that continues to have latency and, um, and continues to have the problem of moderation and moderation. So you know, if you can show me how we, we deal with the latency of settlement and the problems caused by human moderation, then I love what you're doing, but right now I'm having a lot of trouble understanding why this is better than what we have. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's more of a, a statement. Uh, I mean, so I think that in some ways there are a lot of corollaries to the fiat world, right? But like when you and I enter into a contract in the regular fiat world, we're abiding by the terms of the contract because we know there's external consequences if we fail. We know that you can take me to court, you can sue me. Potentially if I did something really bad, somebody could send me to jail, right? In the blockchain land, there is no such thing. So this oracle that we built is basically a primitive um, that allows us to uh, create an economic incentive to be able to get some of this off-chain data on-chain and be able to verify things so that we can do more with our smart contracts that we otherwise would not be able to do because in this blockchain global world there is no you know external jail there is no external single global court system that we can all arbitrate to hi um, what if the token was whoever's money monitoring the information 
misses sort of that full event or that liquidation event, and now the price is corrected. And then secondly, what happens if since then um, tokens have exchanged hands? Great, so on the first question, let's say, you're right, so, so let's say someone um, misses like a situation where uh, the, right, so let's say in that, in that diagram, uh, in that diagram, right? So uh, there was a situation where initially we were here and then we got here and no one uh, called the pull for a price. There are two outcomes, right? One is uh, the next time someone does call for a price, we're still here, so eventually it gets caught, just not by the first person. The second case is that um, by the time someone's come in to say, oh, hey, something looks off, we're back here. In which case what's happened is you've given someone that kind of like yeah, optionality, right, of saying, oh, well, oh, I know I'm under collateralized, but I'm just going to hope that no one calls uh, to pull for a price. I think that's a very valid concern, but the hope is that with lots of different voting token or voting um, with lots of different voters or with lots of different counterparties in a system that has like more liquidity, that people will be monitoring that stuff. And I would say actually one of the cool things about potentially the way that this ecosystem grows is that we eventually have um, third parties that are incentivized to watch for this kind of stuff and pull pull for those kinds of uh, price feeds or um, pull those prices because they've got some kind of economic incentive to do so. So I think there are lots of ways that this could, could be built um, in the future and have like different add-on features. Yeah, um, so all of the systems that you're describing, I, I assume would uh, still like, in whatever jurisdiction they're operating, um, the existing jurisprudence would apply. And I'm wondering how much research you guys have already put, put into types of legal contracts that would be needed to enable um, someone to operate with, with these kinds of systems, right? Yeah. Um, so pretty complicated because every country kind of has their own set of rules. Um, the first thing to kind of understand is that sadly there's a lot of ambiguity when it comes to this stuff. Actually not just because of the blockchain aspect, but just in general. The definition of a derivative and the definition of a security is not always super clear. And it really depends on the specific facts and circumstances of what you're trying to create. So if, for example, you're using a non-security as the, if you're using something that's not a security as collateral, like ETH, and you're using something that's not a security as the reference price index, like the price of Bitcoin, um, and you don't have very high leverage, then you know it's unclear these products, depending on jurisdiction, could be classified as a derivative or a, a loan or a hybrid instrument but certainly not a security. Alternatively, if you use a reference price index that absolutely is a security, like the price of Apple stock, um, or if you're using a margin currency that absolutely is a security, um, like some sort of an STO thing, uh, then yeah, like that would probably be subject to securities regulations. But it always depends on the precise combination of things that you're trying to do. Thank so every one of these UMA contracts has its own token, and when you went through the demo, it had like the date plus the track it was following plus a whole bunch of other stuff. How does the UX work with this when you have thousands of different tokens, and how does this interoperate with the existing exchanges? Like, this isn't going to work on Uniswap, right? It's like, how is this going to scale as you have one more token? Great question. I think, again, there are like two different ways that this could evolve, and probably more. One way that I can see it evolving is uh, we do more financial engineering work on making those tokens fungible between different contracts that have the same parameters. We've done some thinking about how you could implement that um, and decided not to launch our initial version with those additional features because they seem very, very complicated. But it's possible to make a system where all of those things are fungible. I mean, DAI is one example of something where, where they are fungible. And the second is, um, depending on the way that that marketplace for synthetic tokens looks in the future, potentially we could have you know, lots of different individual token sponsors who then create tokens and sell them to individuals. But depending on the way that the, the ecosystem looks in the future, you could imagine a scenario where there actually is one big token sponsor. And maybe that one big token sponsor is actually um, some collection of individuals who've pooled their risk somehow, right? There, there's so many ways that this could grow and change that I think 
definitely like the first thing I mentioned with financial engineering is one thing. The composability with other ways to pool risk is another. Uh, lastly, is maybe there is like a UX solution that works better. So I think there are lots of different ways that this could go, and I'd be more than happy to continue that conversation. Um, have you considered this from a? I mean, obviously you have, but like, do you think this would work from a parametric insurance perspective? Where you just have an event and you get to pay off if there's no rain or if there's too much rain. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so your question is about parametric insurance? Yeah, or just insurance in general where you have the event and there's going to be a payout or, or not. Because I mean, it's essentially the same logic, just a different price feed. So, yes, asterisk with some caveats. Okay. Um, so I think the biggest issue with binary payouts on chain is um, the question of margining. So if you want like a million dollar insurance policy, like I get a million dollars if the rain is really bad this year, um, then the only way to do it really safely is to put the full million dollars into that contract from day one and then have an oracle that tells you whether it rained really badly this year or not. But that's really, really capital inefficient. And most insurance products don't actually work that way. Generally, when you buy a million dollar insurance policy from a normal fiat <coughs> insurance provider, they're only putting up a small amount of money, a small fraction of that million dollars. Um, and uh, they don't have to put the full million dollars up front, otherwise they wouldn't be able to write as many policies as they, they do in the fiat world. Um, so it's, it's, I think this is an area where, at least for right now, um, and the way that we've thought about writing insurance on the blockchain, that it would probably be less competitive to the fiat alternative. But, I mean, you do have a catastrophe bonds, so you basically have, at least as I understand them, you have all of the money in government bonds. And then, as an investor, you just take the risk that you get a return, and all your money goes away if the event happens. But those in the same with I was just saying there are catastrophe bonds where you put all the money up front. There's a kind of bond where you put all the money up front and it disappears if a bad event happens, but I'm not actually sure how popular they are. Yeah, and there's actually still embedded leverage in those and the yeah. way that they work in the fiat world that doesn't really translate easily into blockchain land. Okay. Uh, if you're, if you're collateralized and uh, you know you're going to probably, or you have a dispute, you see that the contract is going to fail after a couple of minutes, what is probably having this um, immediate pricing? When you started the presentation, you started by saying that Bloomberg is a very expensive or those price providers can be very expensive and I agree with you but uh, depending on the magnitude of, of the pricing this, this can also be insignificant it's a trillion their business right so my question is more like about the, the oracles what if you would have like five six different oracles and every derivative uh, front page you have at least where this pricing is coming from if it's going to be from the central bank or from Thomson Reuters or or Bloomberg at this specific time. So my question would be, is this whole mechanism uh, about uh, forgetting about the, the, the price provider or not trusting the price provider because 100% of the financial services just trust Bloomberg as a price provider? So I think that when we were saying expensive, we actually meant expensive in a number of different ways. So expensive is expensive in terms of actually purchasing the data and getting a license with Bloomberg or whoever for that data. But there's also expense with running your off-chain servers, running the DevOps effectively between your off-chain <coughs> server and your on-chain communication, paying the gas fees. Um, and then also all of the coordination costs amongst anybody who's participating in a contract, um, like, uh, the centralized version, so BitMEX, for example, they just decide what their XBT index is. And when they decided that Bitfinex wasn't good enough, or when they want to tweak their algorithm, they just make that decision unilaterally, and they change the way they calculate the price index, they hook up the new APIs, they do all that stuff. But in this blockchain decentralized land, if you don't want a single point of authority in that way to make those decisions, but you similarly have thousands of people who are long and thousands of people who are short in a single smart contract, how can you actually do that effectively? 
just as so, an oracle, maybe the oracle must be like a centralized, already established, trustworthy body, like a Bloomberg or Thomson Reuters or a central bank that the president is coming from, legal authorities. So, it, I mean, it depends, I think, on your use case and where and why you're willing to accept that centralization. But again, even if you are willing to accept Thomson Reuters as the source of truth and you're willing to say, I'm going to go with that price, things still happen. You still get NAN, you still get zero, you get flash crashes where they go back and break the price. And in a smart contract world where you're, everybody's kind of self custodying their own coins, well, if you're using that NAN or the zero price from tops and writers, the coins have already moved. That's a very, very bad system. Yeah, you know yeah. you're under collateralized like before. Like, right. You see the price in the real world and then you're like, oops. Right. And so in this system, right, before the coins can actually move, you go to a decentralized verification mechanism to actually validate that this price is the right price rather than just directly and dumbly using it. So what prevents the voters in the Oracle from shorting the uh, voting token and dropping the cost of the token zero? So in the case that you know, you're able to use Puma to construct all sorts of interesting derivatives, one derivative that could surely be constructed is something that would allow me to short the price of the voting token and therefore drop my cost of the tax zero on pretty much any uh, fee. There's actually potentially an even easier way to do that, which is um, if these tokens were on some sort of a lending protocol and they were being lent out in massive size, you could simply borrow the tokens, take no price risk yourself, um, use the tokens to vote, create lots of bad prices that break every contract, and then, you know, make out like a bandit. Um, so, <laughs> huge problem. Will be really interesting to see how that evolves, but as um, that's why the initial conditions of the token distribution actually matter a great deal, and why it's really important that you have re a really highly engaged um, voter community. So, um, as a rational UMA token holder, as a rational stakeholder, I should never lend these out. Or if I ever observe that there is a meaningful portion of these being lent out, then I should not, I should no longer own these tokens. But in a market where you, you know, you've got hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars locked up in these contracts and then suddenly someone else just decides, screw it, I'm not a voter, but I'm going to create a derivative that will allow me to short this token. Uh, Coordination required to get everyone to peacefully exit their, their contracts before something bad happens is just not right. But you need somebody on the other side who's willing to go levered long. So if you want to short a trillion dollars worth of these UMA tokens, you got to find somebody who's willing to go a trillion dollars long. So in that discovery process, in it will impact the market. There will be signal to the market that this is happening. Um, and so that it should not happen. It would be irrational for that to happen. But, but isn't the payout dependent on like how much value is left inside these contracts? So I mean, like for, for example, if if if, um, if the derivative was worth a lot more than let's just say the total market, market cap of the uh, any game token, as well, like you still have that risk, right? So that that's actually the system that we built, where if you have let's say a hundred million dollars of margin locked inside of smart contracts that are referencing the UMA Oracle. Um, then the UMA tokens must be worth at least $100 million, or the value of the voting tokens actually must be worth at least $100 million in order to prevent a civil attack. So that's actually why we have that dynamic tax rate um, that Regina talked about earlier. So if we ever observe that the value of the tokens is too low for the system to be guaranteed to be economically safe because there's so much margin in the system, we would actually implement the tax on the system and use that tax to buy and burn tokens until the market cap got high enough again. And, and, and so, so what is the tax paid in? Like what, like what form of collateral? Because every, every uh, contract is even collateral, right? Yeah, every contract has potentially different collateral, and uh, the acceptable collateral is a governance parameter of the system. Okay. So you wouldn't be able to just use some random altcoin that nobody actually knows what the value is. Please take your stuff with you. Don't leave it here before you leave. Uh, we, we still have more time for more questions. Okay, I'm going to leave this up so that you, at least you guys know who we are and <coughs> come find us later. Um, yeah, good. Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. <laughs>
It, it seems to me that, um, like looking more uh, sort of holistically at the building here, that uh, by using the pull model instead of uh, the push, you're kind of um, diffusing the, the risk um, to external parties that are not on chain. And um, I'm wondering if there are some ways that the risk becomes more difficult to quantify when uh, that happens because now we're sort of banking on um, a sufficient level of market players and a sufficient amount of market activity to really catch those edge cases where we do need to um, invoke some kind of a, I forget what you called it, a, a, a dispute. Dispute, yeah. Um, and where there might be like uh, things where you're just you're not noticing things are happening because your contract is essentially um, rarely getting a data, right? So uh, I'm just curious if you've thought about this more and, you know, if maybe there's some things being missed here, you know. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think one of the key takeaways is just economic incentives drive the world, right? And so um, within months of MakerDAO, for example, releasing their, keep, their reference implementation of the Keeper code, somebody had already improved it, and yeah. their original code was being beat every single time, um, and they haven't yet had a failed you know, uh, uh, liquidation. So similarly, the, we didn't go into it explicitly here, but a portion of the penalty actually is basically paid out to the caller of the dispute. And so we economically incentivize people to actually go and dispute, in addition to just saying, like, everybody takes some responsibility for it, because, like, you kind of should. Yeah, I mean, engineering-wise, I find it um, any pull versus push mechanism is more elegant, right? So I really admire that and just give you that probably new challenges. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think also standardization is important. So if you so I think if you had a billion smart contracts and a billion different ways to dispute all of them and they were you had to if you had to write a separate API for each of them or whatever to actually to actually be the, the keeper in that system, it would be very hard. So I think the key part of building these sorts of systems and making them successful is making sure there's a standard way to quickly look through all the contracts and make sure there are no disputes across the models. So for instance, if you had 10 MakerDAOs, you'd want them all to have the same API, so the same keeper code would work for all of them. So one person can run one system and monitor you know, 100,000 smart contracts easily. That's the idea. Yeah. How would you say your Oracle solution differs from uh, other solutions out there like uh, Augur or <laughs> like Chainlink or some of these other systems? How would you say yours is kind of unique and um, how are others not necessarily? Is it sort of the around the financial engineering or the derivatives part of it? Um, yeah. So I think the UMA system is very different from systems like Chainlink um, because what Chainlink is effectively doing is taking the programmatic API data and then um, making it such that rather than having a single node reporting on it, you have multiple nodes reporting on it. Um, we're similar to Augur in that we both use a shelling point game to incentivize the reporting of on like honest reporting, um, but we're different in the implementation details, um, specifically that Augur has to have a designated reporter um, initially rather than in our system we're actually using the entire network for reporting and also Augur's markets are done in natural language uh, which is beneficial for some things in that you can do more um, but really harmful for other things in that a lot of markets resolve in uh, invalid um, in UMA system the uh, price requests are standardized so there's just a simple identifier It is a pool system, which uh, is, of course, requires much less uh, uh, points of information than, as you illustrated, uh, you know, with uh, regular intervals. But still, you need a specific action. It's more like, it's not even pool, maybe. It's more like an order. You ask the organ for something, then some action happens on, on in response to that order. So you cannot have, like, 50 organs use the same information, or a 1,000 organs use the same information as you would have if you just regularly push data from the blockchain and then the, 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 different, the different contracts will just pull that one piece of information because they are all doing contracts on gold, for example. But in your case, you would have an action request each time there is a need for result. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, and I would say that's actually a feature, not a bug, because it prevents parasitic usage. It prevents? Parasitic usage. 
So it ensures then that if there's lots of contracts that would like to use our Oracle, well, in order to use it and have the Oracle be useful for them, they've got to be paying their taxes. They can't just observe what other contracts are getting. How, how much more time do we have? I just sure. okay. we still have five minutes more. Perfect. Uh, so actually thinking about the legal framework, would it make sense in your opinion to really anchor the users of the system to a legal agreement? Anchor the users to a legal agreement? Yeah, make a legal agreement between the users of, uh, of the tokens with the sponsors and, uh, and the Oracle holders. That would be something that could happen at the application layer if that was a desired feature, mm -hmm. but not a built-in feature of this. Are you planning to build it? The legal? No. Why not? There's over a hundred countries. <laughs> in many countries, in fact, yes, uh, and the financial instrument will be considered as a security. So if you seek for adoption. Yeah, so I think that that, again, is just something that needs to be handled at the application layer and not the protocol layer. So on, on the dispute resolution process, um, one thing that kind of occurred to me is that you not only need to be able to then query um, your Oracle to find out what the current price is and see whether there's a, a, a discrepancy, a, you know, a significant gap there, but you also need to like, or at least I'm asking, do you need to then query a store, uh, like a certain amount of historical data to verify that this um, uh, upside down? What I don't know what you call the state and derivative where it's, it's not. Yeah, where it's under collateralized, whether this state has occurred in the recent past, right? Because the, the, the dispute generally is saying like something happened here, right? But it might not it might not be in that state anymore, right? So you, I assume you have to kind of go back a ways and say like something that's not anymore. Or sure, because now it's now it's under collateralized. So the point you you call this dispute, you say you're basically saying contract is bad right now. And yeah. we take a timestamp, and yeah, it's going to take some time for that to resolve, but you, you figure out the price exactly at that timestamp when the dispute is called, and you say, is it, is, is the, and you freeze all the margin in the contract, so basically the contract waits to see if it was in, if it was broke, like it was under collateralized at that exact point. Right, and the price at that exact point. So you're saying that there is no support for like some kind of domino effect that would have occurred if you had caught it at that historical point in time, but you no longer caught it. You're no, no longer in that state. Correct. There is, I mean, I wouldn't say no support. I'd say, like, it depends on how you design your financial contract or the plug into the Oracle, but ideally, it should be more of a, it should be more, pre it, it, things are a lot simpler if you do present value. If you, it's kind of complicated if you would say, I want to request, like, 10 prices, and I want to, like, check all these kind of arbitrary points because time is continuous. And you can, you know, you I mean, it, and there are all sorts of complications. But also, like, all our Oracle does is says it returns what is the price of this thing at this time. If you wanted your contract to be complicated, you could request some sort of a slightly historical price. I mean, there's limitations to how historical you can go. And then you can design your contract for that domino effect if you wanted it to. We didn't make that design decision, right. but you could. Well, one challenge about this is that by, do, by making it this way, you, um, sorry, I, my, I lost my train of thought. This is like, come back to me. I'll talk to I want to ask about the UMA. Yeah. Oracle's incentive model, because most of the cost of the Oracle is the collateral that they need to have in order to secure the, basically the operation. And the fact that now we work in the call mode instead of push means that they get much less uh, fees, but still they need to hold the same collateral. So someone needs to pay for, for, the, for the fact that they, they're operating and they, and they stake the, uh, the cost to protect the so one way to think about like a UMA to voting token holders incentives um, is basically compensating them for the work that they're doing um, of providing these prices and compensating them for the opportunity cost of holding on to these tokens rather than selling these tokens and buying something else that could be productive or more yielding or something like that. And when you actually do the math, which is in our white paper, um, you can basically uh, think of it, the value of these tokens as being a discounted cash flow, a discounted cash flow series of all future expected dividend payments. And uh, there's kind of different stages for what a token holder would expect um, over different periods of the ecosystem's growth. So at steady state, 
which is kind of like where fiat derivatives are right now. Um, fiat derivatives have been at around $500 trillion of notional volume for like the last 10 or 20 years. Um, so at a steady state in the UMA ecosystem, the desired compensation for UMA token holders is pretty much simply just the, uh, the yield that they want to be earning on their assets. Uh, whatever that target yield might be, it might be a function of the environment, it might be a function of how much work they have to do, etc. Um, but you can think about what those assumptions might be. You can look at like traditional stocks um, and what the dividend yields are for those things um, and, and come to some number like if an UMA token holder might demand a 5% annualized yield or a 10% annualized yield and then back that into what the taxes would look like on, um, on, uh, on the financial contract users. And it's actually quite reasonable. Um, so back of the envelope math tells us that something like a 50 basis point annualized tax on these financial contract templates on just the margin, which is an even smaller percentage of notional, would be sufficient to compensate UMA token holders and still earn them a, health, a healthy yield. Uh, a little bit about the, the roadmap and the current usage. Uh, I see you're plugged only into Ethereum, but are you blockchain agnostic as a protocol? And then the second question is uh, regarding testnet, mainnet, uh, and what are people basically building that you have seen on the past six months, maybe a year from now, mm -hmm. uh, ago. <coughs> it's basically only interest rates, more effects, it's a die versus what are the actual projects that are coming using the protocol? Sure, so um, the synthetic token template, that financial contract template, it's both deployed on mainnet and testnet. The mainnet implementation is referencing a centralized oracle. So it was really just to test proof of concepts of different applications and use cases. Earlier this year, a market maker used it to create a US stock index token so that anybody who owned crypto could also own US, get exposure to US stocks. Um, we ended up deprecating that. Um, and now we're working with other uh, kind of uh, other proof of concepts around, we, I think I mentioned currencies earlier, there's a different stock thing that we're working on now with a different um, application layer provider. Those are coming out later this year or next. On the decentralized Oracle side, um, our biggest internal priority is to get that onto mainnet um, later this year or early next year. Um, right now it's still in private alpha testing. Um, and your final question. Is your blockchain agnostic? Blockchain, just the theoretically, area. yes. <laughs> Theoretically, yes, but practically speaking, um, the Ethereum community is pretty magical, and I think DeFi composability and standardization is a huge component of what gives this stuff value. So until or unless other blockchains actually um, have that type of community where these applications really make sense, it doesn't make sense to try to go and deploy elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so during your talk, you sort of showed how a lot um, projects are relying on some you know, 15 minute tool, let's say, of price feeds that are being pushed to the chain. If you have a lot of these tools in existence that use the same Oracle, um, why wouldn't they sort of band together and batch them in lots of 15 minutes and then it kind of degrades to just one price feed and you can actually end up with a lot more value in relying on the Oracle than is being paid in taxes because they don't all need to double up. If someone's just created the Oracle, last five minutes, I probably don't need to create it again, and I can avoid the tax. Yeah, yeah, so what you, what you are, uh, the question you're asking about is basically what Augur calls parasitic usage, right? And maybe, do you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, we have some, we have uh, quite a few ideas about how to, how to deal with this, but the rough idea is that, like, we, we don't want you to be able to do that. We want you. Uh, so we have we have designs for like basically whitelisted contracts in some ways based on their bytecode, making sure they kind of follow the rules to allow them into our system. And it's a little bit technical how we prevent contracts from getting around those whitelists by just like reading the reading chain data, like basically proving this data exists in the smart contract and reading it that way. Um, but it's a little more like we can talk offline. It's a little more different. I mean, the, the summary is kind of just fuzzing so that you can't directly read outputs, but it's all fuzz so that's private information. Yeah, we, we do payouts rather than like prices. So you don't say the price is $5, you say this person gets $7 and this person gets $3. And that way it's unique to the contract and not and everybody can't use that because it's specific to that particular contract. If you want a price, you'd have to request someone. So we can take a
Last, last question. Yes. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about the redemption of the underlying that expiry? So like, I've got these tokens and like a thousand people have bought them and now it expires. Uh -huh. They need to go and pull their underlying out of the contract, right? How does that work? What is the direction of that? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I, I think uh, there is like a, a challenge of how do you broadcast to all token holders that it's time to redeem yeah. the tokens. I mean, ideally they, they know that they should go back and redeem for the underlying collateral. Again, a lot of different solutions I'm going to throw out there. One is that uh, you know you could have the wallets be in charge of that, right? So if you're a wallet that's supporting these kinds of tokens, like you're able to go back and read what is the expiration date and notify your users, right? That's one way. The other way is in our synthetic token builder DAP, we have right now it's geared really towards the token sponsors, right? Because it shows you what your collateralization is and what you should do, uh, deposit or withdraw. Again, that could turn into a portal that all token holders use, as well as token sponsors. A lot of different answers. Uh, but we definitely love to collaborate on uh, different types of projects if you're interested in building that kind of functionality. I mean, ultimately, I would say they kind of, the solutions that we've envisioned all currently live at the application layer, not the protocol layer. So we're building this infrastructure and would love to, if you have ideas about how we can support at the protocol le level, would love to hear them otherwise. Okay. Yeah. I think we're going to end here, but we'd love to chat uh, outside and, and later on the conference.